Okay. Good morning. I have a special guest here today. Phil, I'll throw it over to you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Alison. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Phil Hay Sinclair. Uh, I am a, a girl dad. I um, am also a company builder, um, and I build a company at the moment called Drop Bio, which is a digital health company based here in uh, New South Wales. And I'm also an educator. I teach at the University of New South Wales. Fantastic. And we are really excited to have you here today to share some different insights. So to get started, this is a personal reflection, but can you just share what is one mental health tactic that you yourself use? Not every day is going to be the best day in the world, but what are some go-to mental health tactics that you find you use? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think even you know, prior to COVID, I was doing a little bit of this, but I really ramped it up during COVID and the lockdowns and um, you know, trying to be somebody who is a, a husband, somebody who's got young kids, homeschooling, working, all the stuff, all the things, all the life that we've had to lead. Um, what I found was tremendously useful to me was a morning routine um, that I could sort of control. And where there was a very small amount of control in the world, the ability to sort of say, um, I can quarantine a part of the day, which is just for me. Um, and I could do whatever I wanted to. But the things I ended up doing each day um, inside that routine, which was early in the morning, um, were uh, doing a little bit of meditation um, and using guided meditation. I used mind um, headspace. Um, and then being able to get out and see the world. So I would go for a walk after that. And for somebody who does a lot of athletics in my life, I didn't really do a lot of exercise sort of stuff. I just went for a walk and I wanted to pay attention to things that were around me. Um, and it's, it might sound a bit trite, but even just seeing the sunrise, seeing the sky, hearing the birds, hearing dogs bark, seeing traffic go back and forward, it was the ability to sort of get out of my own head and just see the world and breathe it in. Um, and I did that religiously every day for the better part of 200 days. And it was it just made all the difference. And it's really easy to stay in bed. It's really easy to sort of go, oh, I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to let that bother me. But I found that in the one or two days where I didn't do it, the rest of my day was significantly worse because I didn't take advantage of that, that part of the day. So for me, it was the routine and ritual around being able to see it. And I actually love it. It was, it was the best part. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing. I don't think we've actually had anyone share the importance of a, of a morning routine here in the stories yet. And I'm a huge advocate for it. I do spend, uh, I'm going to say at least a good hour and a half prepping and priming for yep. the day before it comes out. And boy, does it make a huge difference. It does, totally. Fantastic. And um, New South Wales has certainly been through some challenges with all the lockdowns, et cetera. So I'm going to steer into this next question. What is a message of hope that you can share for someone who may be going through the eye of the world wind right now where their mental health could be affected? Uh, in the health sector, they've been predicting one of the waves of the pandemic is a psychological one, and boy, are we seeing it. Uh, yep. I believe in the news I saw uh, 40 young women presenting with self-harm at emergency services, the intensive care unit at the hospital per day of some of the Sydney lockdowns. So, some of this stuff we've seen before, but the frequency that is happening has been pretty horrific. And, uh, you know, with trauma, for example, people may be feeling like they're fine and it just could hit them one day. So do you have yeah. any message of, of hope that you would like to share for those who may need to hear it? Look, I'll certainly give it my best shot. I think that when we hear a statistic like that, um, that is the tip of the iceberg. So I think it's important to re remember that for those who have brought themselves to um, be able to seek help, they're a small proportion of what's actually happening in the community. And so the, the idea and the, the reason that campaign like this is so important is that we're trying to normalize the idea that you are not alone. Um, men, women, different ages, different ethnicities, um, we are all going through a, a weirdness that is exacerbating existing underlying mental health conditions, or for people who are experiencing this for the first time, um, it's frightening and it can be, and it can get out of control. And so I guess the, the thing that I would say, and there are probably maybe two tips like, um, put into this in terms of hope. Um, the first one is that every storm passes. 
Mm. Um, and sometimes that storm can be intense and it can go on for a long time, but it will pass, mm. but you can't do it by yourself. And so as much as it is really um, important for people like us um, who can listen well and can do things like get the resources from Mind Blank or go and look at other places where they can get educated. Like um, I, I find it really fantastic that we have um, mental health first aid courses you can go and do now to learn more about how you can listen, how you can ask questions, how you can hand somebody off to the right care um, as, as an everyday citizen, super fantastic. But the storm will pass. And um, when I look at the generation coming through, the reason why I can feel confident in that statement is that I look at my daughters, I look at their friends, I look at the way that they have viewed COVID, where in some cases, COVID for my six-year-old has been essentially a third of her life. Mm -hmm. And they're reformatting how they think about the world. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the next generation, they're thinking about it differently. I think it's up to us for our generation and for our parents and, and ones who are a little bit older to sort of surround them with love and care and kindness and just be there to spend time with them. So it'll pass, but you're not alone and you can seek help and please do seek the help. Um, because no one's bulletproof and we there are a lot of people willing to do a lot of the helping. Yeah, for sure. I definitely uh, resonate with, you know, in these times of adversity, it, be kind. There's still ways that you can show love, respect and patience in this time. Uh, and it can certainly feel whirlwinding, but I do have to really agree with you that there are some courses such as the mental health first aid course for example that can help uh, build some skills just to help understand uh, some of the basic knowledge we tend to find the role of the accidental counsel is one that blurs all the time uh, where someone who may actually be trying to help support uh, an individual ends up accidentally filling that role as a counselor and uh, yes. <laughs> how sometimes that stance, if they're not a mental health professional themselves, it's counterproductive for the individual. It delays getting help. Uh, it burdens two people sometimes. If it's a really tricky situation, two people end up with the weight of the world on their shoulders. And so yeah. it is important to have enough knowledge to know when to uh, refer over to some of the services for sure. Yeah, I, I think just to build on that, um... When, when you hear of maybe a parent looking after um, their children who are suffering of, of mental health um, challenges, or as we talked about previously, if a child is looking after their parents or uncles or aunties or whatever else, I think there's enough normalization that's happened over a really short period of time that where the stigma was, we just don't talk about that. If you have the courage, which can take a lot, but if you have the courage to sort of say to a friend of yours, I think I'm really struggling or I'm struggling to care for someone, then I think eight or nine times out of 10, the person that you've said that to will go, how can I help? Mm -hmm. Right. Like, and you, there might not be a lot that that person can do. Maybe the act of listening is just what you need at the time. Yeah. But I would encourage anybody who is in that situation um, as a carer in particular, just to say, listen, I'm, I'm just, I'm low on gas because I'm caring for this person, I'm trying to look after myself and my people, and it's, you know, I'm exhausted because I think the key thing that we're seeing across the board here is just exhaustion, right, yeah. across the board. And that's that's sort of the, the kindling for what, if you light it well, will turn into, uh, into, into more difficult mental health situations. Yeah, no, really good insight there. Thank you. Um, I do feel like I also want to just touch on it to say that one common uh, I don't know if you call it stigma or misconception that we find sometimes people approach us if they've never been through uh, some of these mental health challenges before that help seeking pathway. There is that misconception that when they're seeking help and it's a crisis now that they'll get help now, you know, yeah. it's actually a long journey. You know, when, when someone is caring for someone or being the person that requires that support, there still requires some time before you see progress. Uh, it can certainly, there's ways to ease some of that initial support with bystanders and um, 
a trusted network around you, but it's still going to be a journey yep. to recovery. So it's going to be interesting 2022. I think so. I think so. Yeah. Okay. I will bring you to the next question. If you are comfortable with it, there was that question of if you had any experience supporting someone who has been suicidal or even first-hand experience of lived experience of suicide ideality, what we are asking people is just if you have any insights as to what help or direct action steps that could have actually been helpful because the common ground that we're finding is uh, suicide ideation can happen. We all experience uh, ups and downs and sometimes we can hit rock bottom. Uh, but the purpose of asking this question is what can we do to help skill other people if they're in a position right now and they've got a friend or a colleague who may be showing um, some signs of suicide ideation if they don't necessarily have that experience? Is there any insights uh, or action steps that you yourself have come across that were very helpful steps to take uh, that we can share with community? Yeah, so um, this is not lived experience on my on my side, but what I can say as a veteran, as a military veteran, um, our community has been, you know, very um, uh, publicly shown to suffer of post-traumatic stress, which can lead to what you just described. Um, and I've lost good friends as a consequence of that. And, you know, often, um, you're at the other end of a phone. Um, you may not see them because they're in different states. You don't see them as regularly as you would if they were around the corner in the same in the same suburb. Um, and I think the the real thing for somebody who is trying to support um, or is worried that something might go like escalate quite quickly, and it can, as you know, it can concertina really quickly given the time and the the triggers that are at play. Um, for me, what I found was I, I really needed to put in a really concerted effort to regularly be in contact with the people who I knew that were at risk. Um, and that almost meant a, a drumbeat every week or and sometimes multiple times a week, sometimes daily, when I knew that the situations were on. And, and what I, I found really difficult in that situation um, for a very good friend of mine was that... Um, I didn't know if I was ever doing enough yeah. and I didn't know how to sort of regulate against that. And so one strategy that we put into place, and when I say we, I I'm, I'm talking about um, our collection of friends that were crowding around this person um, to provide support. It can get exhausting. You can feel guilt about not doing enough, doing too much. It, it's, it's, quite an, it's quite a roller coaster. What we found was where there was four or five of us sharing the load, um, it created sort of a network around this person of care where all of us would look at it with different perspectives. Um, and in sharing that perspective, it allowed us to um, provide better support and better care for that person over the medium term. Unfortunately, we were unsuccessful in being able to support him and um, he's now no longer with us. Um, but it was a hell of a journey to understand that actually it's not all on you as the person trying to provide the care even though it feels like when you're in that one-on-one -on -one conversation and the conversation itself sounds and feels hopeless. Um, the, the first thing that I found to be really helpful on that is um, who else can I share the load with? Yeah. Um, no one wants to carry the load. No one, everyone would like not to have to do that job. Mm -hmm. But when you love somebody um, and who's a brother of yours, you want to try and find the people that will end much to my surprise and delight, um, there were easily four people that said, no, no, I'm in, what can I do? Um, and it was it was really, really quite useful. So I think the, the key message here is don't go it alone. Yeah, that's extremely powerful. And sorry to hear about the loss of your friend there. Um, it is part of this suicide advocacy space. You know, sometimes it will feel like you can't do enough. Yeah, And I feel like sometimes the mental health first aid course or training won't always prepare you for the adrenaline rush you're going to get if you have to intervene and mm, sometimes great. they don't tell you that it can take hours to get that ambulance there you know and in mm. the meantime you could be still on standby there to support that person but yeah. as individuals we sure can only do what we can <clears throat> you know yep. to, to help support and that individual certainly does need to want help um and they could be at various parts of their journey. And that is a hard aspect to swallow. But yep. uh, 
we can only do what we can as individuals. It sounds like a fantastic tactic that you shared, being able to pull in a little community of trusted people to help carry that load. Invaluable mm. insight. Um, thank you so much for sharing it. You're welcome. Uh, my final question to you is if anyone would like to get in touch with you or find out more about what you do, how can they do that? Sure, thank you. Um, well, I'm on LinkedIn um, where all my professional pursuits are listed and I also have a blog where I write quite actively on, um, on well-being and company building and just trying to do good things in the world and that uh, URL is philhsc.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your time today and being part of this journey. We really appreciate you sharing your insights today. You bet, anytime. Fantastic. Thank you. I look forward to bringing more stories shortly.